recording. There we go. All right. So here we go. Um, this is phi. Okay, yo. So I gave you guys you know, a kind of really complicated looking phi. This is the negation of the entire phi. So that means you know everything within the parentheses is phi. But I have to negate it first because the whole point of proof by contradiction is that the conjunction of what is given to you to be true, which is our psi, and the negation of the theorem that we want to kind of ver validate, <clears throat> that needs to be false. So that means you know, we have to negate um, the proposed you know, theorem, which is the highlighted portion. So then, you know, we go step by step, okay? So the first step that I did this time was not to apply um, the definition of implication. The first thing I did is actually the Morgan's Law. So I applied the Morgan's Law, which is distributing, quote unquote, you know, the negation to everything in the inside of the parentheses, um, and then turn all the ors into ands. So let me uh, kind of explain what I mean by that. So this term is ORed with this term, which is also ORed with this bigger term, which is also ORed with this term here. So we have the negation of an OR. When you apply the Morgan's Law, then we have the negative version of each individual term that were ORed together, but now they have to be ended together. Yes? Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Do I have to do that as a separate category? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Uh, commutative and associative laws are pretty obvious, you know, so you don't really have to do it in a separate step unless it is clear, it, it, it's more clear to you than it's easier for you to fix problems in case you make a mistake. Yep. But from my perspective, you know, that's okay. You don't have to you know, break those up into individual steps. <clears throat> All right, so from the second to the third, I apply the definition of implication. So this is the definition of <clears throat> implication. And the way we use that rule is when you see something implies something else, then we end up with a or, and we negate the left-hand side before we do the or of the right-hand side. So we apply that twice because we have one implication here and one implication of over here. So there are two applications of the definition of implication. Do we have any questions at this point? Okay. So it, it just looks busy, but if you do it step by step, you know, I don't think it's really too hard. So now we end up with something that is really close to a um, <clears throat> CNF already. Because we ended up with, um, you know, after I cleaned up the double negation stuff, okay, so we just say, you know, double negation goes away. Yes, this is a formal name of a <coughs> algebra rule. <laughs> and after that, I use associative law, okay, because, you know, the parentheses are not necessary anymore. So this pair of parentheses are not necessary anymore. Um, is that what I did? Yep, I think I did. Okay, so this is associative law, you know, which basically, you know, just get rid of the extra parentheses. <clears throat> and then these two lines are exactly the same, except I reordered things a little bit. So if you want to comment, you know, this is commutative. Um, and then I applied um, distribution. So to get rid of this thing here, because this is a conjunction within a disjunction, that is not okay in a CNF, so I applied um, distribution in this case. Okay, does everybody see how distribution is applied in this case? Because it is, it may not be very obvious. Okay, if I add extra parentheses, maybe you can see that. Would that does that help? Okay, so let me let me just kind of describe you know that particular uh, distribution that I use here. Um, basically, if you have you know a, <clears throat> okay, if you have a plus b, and then the whole thing plus you know c d, okay, which is kind of the format that we have here. Um, distribution you know can turn this into a plus oops b plus c 
and A plus B plus D. That is the distribution. Basically, A plus B is seen as one thing, and then I use you know, the distribution to, this is the odd one, because you know, in normal algebra, you cannot distribute this way. This is the one that only works in Boolean algebra. Is that okay? Does everybody kind of see how, which distribution I used here, okay? So that's real, really useful, because what it did was it generated your know, two um, terms, and each one is okay to be a component <laughs> inside the CNF. This is your know, T or not S or not Q, and then this one here is T or not S or not R, because you know, I just split you know, this conjunction into two parts and combined with the other part. Is that okay? All right. So I could have stopped here. In other words, at this point, this thing is a CNF already. It has met all the requirements to be a CNF. It is a conjunction of disjunctions, and inside each disjunction, uh, we can only have variables or the negation of variables. So it has met all of those requirements already. But I did you know, do a little bit more steps, okay? So I'm gonna erase this because it is not a part of the derivation, so I'm gonna get rid of this. <clears throat> but I did a, did a little bit more because I thought, hey, if I can simplify this as much as possible, it will only help later on when I have to do the um, resolutions. So I look at this mess here. I reordered things a little bit, and did I re delete too much? I think I might have deleted too much. Let me backtrack a little bit. Nope, I did not delete too much. Let me see, how did I end up with that T by itself? I'm just looking. Huh, okay, I'm, I'm just trying to see how I ended up with the T all by itself. I think it's by factoring, oh, yep, that's it, okay. So it's by factoring, um, we have T or Q over here, and then we also have T or not S or not Q. So I can do factoring, which is the reverse of distribution. So I take the T out, which is the common thing, and then I take the Q out of this one and put it here, and then I also take the T out of here, but then I have not S or not Q over here. So it is the reverse of distribution, it's factoring. Okay, is that okay so far? Does everybody see how I applied factoring in this case? Now this one does look like the normal factoring that you do in algebra. Um, so I hope it's a little bit more obvious. Yes, okay. <clears throat> and then I, from here to here, I applied actually quite a few steps. Uh, the first one is um, Q or not Q is true. So if you have a true already inside the disjunction, the entire disjunction is going to be true, which means, hey, it's not going to do a single thing inside a conjunction. So this entire thing goes away. Is that okay? So once this goes away, then I use absorption because the homework assignment specifically said absorption can be used even during the phase of, um, well, the previous homework assignment already talked about absorption. So the absorption is absorbing this one and also this one because in a conjunction, the more restrictive term is only, it, we only need a more restrictive term. The more general terms can all go away. So if you compare T versus T or blah, 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 T or blah, 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 the T or blah, blah, blah are unnecessary, okay? They can be there, okay? It doesn't really change anything, but they are useless. So that's why, you know, this term turns into a one and then it goes away because it's the identity of conjunction. This, ter this term goes away because of absorption 
this term also goes away because of absorption. Is that okay? So I did combine quite a few steps into here, into something that looks simpler. And then I look at this and go like, hmm, I wonder if this you know, or not R can just kind of go away because that would be kind of cool. <clears throat> so instead of, so what I did was I do it in algebra because I'm pretty sure there's a rule in Boolean algebra that allows you to just apply that rule and do this. But you can also just use all the algebraic rules that we have already talked about, which is looking at R and S or not R and then use distribution first, okay? So after you apply distribution, then we have R and S, which is here, or R and not R, which is over here. R or not R is false, okay? You know, it's you know, one of the rules you know, specifies that. So then we have R and S or false, but anything or false is just the original thing because false is the identity of disjunction. So now we have just your know, T and R and S. So after we reorder the, or, you know, the letters, then we just end up with R and S and T. Yes? So I feel like it can't be right. Like, so, I, so I feel like I have to be making the same way that the T is not that. Mm -hmm. Do you not use the distribution on, so like right, right on that kind of first step, which is just the like thing you said, when you have T or not S or not R, and then you have S or not R. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. But then in that case, if you then had T or not R as well as everything else, then wouldn't you then be able to do absorption so that you only had T or T and R? Like well, you, yeah, so right here, you can already apply a, um, resolution yeah. right here because you, you have an R and then you have a not R here. So when you apply resolution, then you have you know, just the S remaining. But then you cannot get rid of the other ones because you know it's not a because remember a resolution is an implication. It says you know this side implies the other side, but it doesn't necessarily go go back the other direction. So you cannot use equality in that case. Yes. Huh. No, it is not the same as the reverse of, uh, of absorption <clears throat> because absorption is basically saying if you have a more specific term and then you have more general terms, then the only the spe more specific term needs to be here. The more general terms can all go away. But they all have T and not the negation of T. Resolution depends on you need to have T and also the negation of T in order to apply resolution. So it is, they are not the same thing. Yeah, go ahead and then. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, say so, say that again. We don't have to assume anything because these are all algebraic, you know, uh, manipulation. That is correct. So when you look at the actual meaning of the, this expression, it does basically say if T is false, then everything is false. If R is false, everything is going to be false. The entire thing is false, I should say. So if T is true, then not T is guaranteed to be false. Yes. So can we replace all the last two with the zero? Um, where? Here or the, the step before? Right. All the way before. Huh? Right. Say that one more time. Starting with which row? Oh, you mean this? You mean here? Um, okay, but that's not an algebraic rule because it's a very specific thing that you're applying, you know, because that only works when R is by itself in the conjunction, right? So, you know, it's okay to use it in the homework assignment 
um, but it's not a particular rule, which means you know it it seems to make sense, but you have to kind of prove that that works in general. So you know. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not like I wouldn't allow that in the test. You know, you can still do the derivation you know, the way you did it in the test. Um, I'm just not comfortable if it is not based on an established rule. So what you can do, okay, this is what you can do. <clears throat> so you, what you can do is to say, you know, I am inventing a new algebraic rule, okay? So that what you can do is now to say, you know, um, uh, you got x, you got y as two independent variables, and then you basically just say that, you know, x and y or oh, not x or y is really the same thing as um, y itself. Okay, so so you you have to prove that this, generally speaking, this is true. So how do you do that? We can use a truth table. So you can now say this is false, false, this is false, and this is also false. False, true, okay. In this case, it is still false, and y is true. Okay, so that doesn't work. It will just be, huh? X, Y, yep. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it is also just false, and then you have one false, you know, one, one zero, okay. X is true, Y is false. So in that case, you would have false over here, and you will also end up with false over here. And when you have both of them being true, then you have true here, because y is true, x is true. So even though not x is false, it doesn't really matter. And you also have true over here. So once you analyze it like this and say, you know, for all possible cases of x and y, this expression is the same as this expression, now you can use it as a rule. So instead of intuitively thinking about it and say, well, you know, if x is true, then not x is going to be false. So it, it, it's almost, you know, not x is not here. That's intuitive, which is not incorrect, but it is not uh, rig rigorous. This is a lot more rigorous. This is basically saying every time I see this pattern, it can be simplified to this pattern over here because I have already exhaustively tested every single possible case. I know I can apply this anytime I see this pattern. Just change it to that pattern. Simplify it. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> in order to, so I can, I can think about it, like, so, like, equivalent is a byproduct of having a general table, and um, things are being implication is a product of, like, implication is not a rigorous table. Right. This Mm -hmm. There are multiple ways to prove the equivalency between uh, expressions. In the case of Boolean algebra, you really have a lot of choices. In normal algebra, we may not have as many choices. So in here, I'm just using you know the other algebraic rules to establish that x and not x or y is really the same thing as x y. I do not use a truth table, and yet you know, each step is the application of a known um, algebraic rule. So I apply your know, distribution first, and then x not x simplifies to false, and false is the identity of of disjunction, and we just end up with x y. So I can do it that way too. Uh huh. And Mm -hmm. That we that like we can't create new um I, I like I'm like sorry, like thinking about the ideas of 
Um, but you, but it's like you can't create new uh, algebraic rules based on like 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 this wouldn't be a theorem of uh, like the the x y would not be a theorem of like x not x y because then that would be like a it is a theorem. So if this is, if I give you, uh, if I give it to you as psi, and I say this is phi, then you know, x y is a theorem of x and the disjunction between mod x and y. You can call it a theorem because you know, because in this case it's an equivalence, right? So equivalence is consisting of two implications going in one direction and also going in back in the other direction, which means. If you can establish equivalency, it is automatically a theorem because implication is already there. Yes. This time it is bi directional. So if you can prove that something is a theorem of both parts, yep. then you can prove that you had equivalence. So, in, in other words, you know, from the logic perspective, the equal sign you know, should have been. If and only if, <clears throat> in this case, so that means you know the derivation is go it goes in both directions. You know you can start with x y, and I don't know for what reason you want to re-express it as x and the negation of x or y, but you can if you want to. So it can go in both directions in this case, but resolution only goes in one direction. Yep. Yep. Well, the proof that I did in class only goes in one direction. Mm, no, because you know what we what we're trying to say is, um, if this is true, then this has to be true. If this is true, then this has to be true. So we want to use that chain of implication to eventually get to false. So we don't really care that so much about going back. All right, so that was a good discussion. And so now when we have a conjunction you know, between psi and the negation of phi, which really is just a concatenation of the solution from last Wednesday, and also the uh, conjunct the CNF that I just worked out today, which is just RST, which is really easy. So in this one, if you want to go for the super systematic way to do things, you can go. You can do that. It's just going to take a little bit longer. But if you see that, oh, R and S and T is really the negation of you know the it's really the negation of the disjunction of not R, not S, not T. Then you go like, oh, we'll just kind of focus on that one because you know that would get me the solution like in no time. So that's what I did. <clears throat> I labeled each one, each term in the CNF the combined CNF and I just go like okay let's make a new one by look by resolving between two and four so two is this one four is this one one has not R the other one has R so the R goes away we only get not S or not T left which is now numbered seven and then we go like wait we have an S here and this is one has a not S so five and seven can resolve I call it number eight and you know the remaining item is not t, and then this not t can resolve with the t, so six and eight can also resolve. But this time we have nothing left between the parentheses. When you see there's nothing left between the parentheses, there's a implicit false as a constant inside the parentheses. So we are done. So the bottom line is um, because psi and not phi is false because we just proved that then phi is implied by psi because of proof by contradiction. All right, so I'm just gonna pause here and see if there are any questions about the solution to the homework assignment. Yes, uh, you first and then you. Go ahead. Say that one more time. So if you if you apply the Morgan block, like so, like or like so so like if you apply the Morgan block to RST, it is not like not phi. Yeah. Um, like if you negate RST and then apply the Morgan block, you get not R or not S yeah. or not T. Does that then mean that you could also like that you could sort of you know like 
obviously not. You can no. use algebra to do it. Yes. Yeah, but like, I mean, like, does that mean that, that phi is linearly related to phi? Like, 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 Not automatically, because you know you. Okay, I suppose yes. Okay, because in that case, the bottom line is is psi implying phi. So if phi is a okay, if psi is known to be a conjunction, and phi is known to be a component in the conjunction, that does not automatically mean that that implication works. You still have to prove that. Yeah. In other words, what you're looking at is oops okay i just typed something i'm not supposed to okay so what you're really looking at here okay so even if you recognize that phi is a component of the conjunction that makes up psi then you have to prove this you have to say we have x we got y okay <clears throat> and then you have you know x and y which is your psi and then you have y by itself which is your theorem so you still have to prove that x y implies y is always true so let's let's work this out okay so i i know you guys are probably thinking go like okay this is super confusing <clears throat> okay okay so th those are all the possible values between x and y and now we look at x y x and y right you know this is false i mean and then we got false over here we got false over here and then we got true over here why is y? I mean, I'm just replicating the column that we saw earlier, but this time it is an expression of interest. So that's why we are replicating it. So now the question is, what about the implication? False implies blah is always true. Okay, one, one, um, oops, uh, yes, okay, and one. And then for the last one, we have true implies true, which is also true. So the bottom line is, I want this implication to be always true. In other words, the intuitive way of looking at this, of saying, hey, you know, y, which is our um, not r or not s and not t, that's phi, right? It is already a component of the conjunction that is our psi. But does that automatically make it a theorem? The answer is, well, let's mechanically show that that is the case. Uh huh. And then you're like, it's like its own separate thing. Um, I guess like if that was the case, like it would not be, it would be a theorem of the, like if, if, if psi was just like, like x, y, t, and then phi was just t, it wouldn't be a theorem still? Because it would, no, it, in that case, you know, z is still a theorem of x, y, z. Because I, I'm, I'm interpreting when you said x, y, and z, it, you, you meant x and y and z as one single conjunction. Yeah. And then z is, all, is the theorem that we want to prove. So I'm interpreting the, your statement like that. So in that case, yes. Because you know, in, in that case, you're simply saying you know, there are two things in, in, in x, but you're, we're treating it as one. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that true table where we have x, y, and x, and z? You mean here? This, no, the second, the, uh, the truth table about that. You mean here? Isn't that just resolution? Um, resolution has the same truth table, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> but that's not the general resolution because the general resolution would also, this is not usually not by itself. This is also in a disjunction of some kind and it has you know, X as one of the components of that disjunction. So this is not the general resolution. Because the general resolution yeah, has, it has x or some other theorem, right, yeah, and then the conjunction of right, not x and another term, yes, or or another term, sorry, yeah. But, so um, if you want to use a, a truth table to prove that resolution itself works, then you end up with you you need three independent variables in that truth table instead of two. So this is an application of resolution, but we still have to. Yes, you can look at this as a deformed uh, resolution, 
because you know it is deformed because you know the other term, the quote unquote third term, is just a constant of false. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So you can you can look at it that way. Yeah. But but this truth table does not automatically prove that resolution, generally speaking, works. Okay. It only shows that in this specific deformed way of you know looking at resolution, it works. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I was just gonna ask because mm -hmm. I brought my resolution steps for different. Those, That's okay. But, but <laughs> the okay. Is, is that okay? Yeah, because yeah, as as, like, yeah. Because I did not go for the systematic approach. Because if I had gone gone for the systematic approach, then I would have tried to match up one with everything, and one obviously does not match anything. Then I would have used two to match with three. Nope. I would match it with four. Yes. Match it with five. Yes. Match it with six. Yes. But then it will produce three new expressions, each one having two variables. Yeah. So that would make it longer. Yeah. The process would get longer. Process, yeah, which is fine. Yeah, because I did not tell you ahead of time whether it will resolve or not. So you do not have the, I I cheated because I knew it would resolve to false. So I just go like, okay, let's go for the shortest route and make sure that and prove that it is false. You did not know that ahead of time. So using the more systematic way to do it is the proper way to do it. Yep. So if you want to, so if I give you a phi that is not a theorem of psi, then you have to resolve systematically until you kind of hit a dead end. Hitting a dead end means you know, okay, I can still resolve, but the result of the resolution is something that's already, I have seen it already. It's it's one of the previous steps. And that would be suspicious. That is correct. It is yeah. It is not a theorem in the sense that psi does not imply phi. It does not mean that phi has to be false all the time. It simply means that one does not imply the other. Yep. All right, very good. We have about 10 minutes left because I do have to go a little bit early today because I have to <clears throat> work with uh, the dean. I mean, I can probably go by latest, you know, by 55-ish. Uh, you know, so we still have a little bit of time. So we can get started with um, the exam two, you know, sample exam, um, which is not really exactly the right way to call it because it really is the exam from last semester. So we'll take a look at that. Um, and okay, let me do this right there. Okay, so I got it loaded onto the tablet already so I can actually hand write on it. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully it's still connecting, and of course it's not. <laughs> All right, let me uh, redo this part. Okay, so that's that. All right, and we'll do a refresh here. And doesn't like it. Let's do it one more time. Try again. Ah, okay. <clears throat> I guess I'll just go for the not so high tech approach. All right, so the not so high tech approach is just me getting to the document here. There we go, same thing. All right, <clears throat> so this is question number one, and there are three questions that are very similar in the previous exam. Um, and this, is, has, this has the same kind of feel as the first exam in which uh, I give you uh, C0 and C1 in this case, you know, those are quote unquote functions. They only return, okay, let me, let me ask you what they return. So if you look at the way C0 is defined, <clears throat> what does it return? This is C0, 
it is um, just tell me the type of the return value. What does it return? No. A set, okay? It returns a set because whatever it returns is enclosed in curly braces. Okay, so it returns a set. <clears throat> a set of what? So this, this is the, the clue that you need to read. It returns, so what does each element look like within the set that C0 is returning? Each item that it returns is also a set of two items. So, all right. So, okay, so let's go back and look at this notation here because I think we haven't seen this for a while and some people have forgotten this particular notation. So this means we have a set such that each element is a set by itself having E and F as elements. Such that ERF is true, FRE is true, and E does not equal to F, and E is in X, and F is in X. That's how we read this. Okay, for, so let's pause for a moment and make sure that everybody is understanding you know, what we are constructing here. This is a notational thing, okay? You know, we haven't touched this particular notation for some time, but do you remember how to read this notation? We're describing the membership of a set. Okay, so let me go a little bit step by step here. <clears throat> this part here, which is you know, to the left-hand side of the single vertical bar, is basically specifying the format of each element in the set that we are describing. Is that okay? So this is telling me that each element of the set that we're constructing is by itself a set. Not only that, it has exactly two elements, E and F. Is that okay? All right. So what E and what F should I include? Okay, that becomes the question <clears throat> that is answered by the right-hand side of the vertical bar. So the right-hand side of the vertical bar is now describing the requirements or the criteria of you know, what do you, how do you choose E and F, okay? So first of all, we need E, R, F, okay? Which means you know, E, F are related as a tuple. So E, F has to be in R as a set. F, R, E, which is the other way around, F, E as a two tuple has to be in R, which is a set of two tuples. <clears throat> e and F cannot be the same. E has to be an element of X. F has to be an element of X. So are we, are we good so far in terms of understanding what um, this notation is trying to describe? It's trying to describe the membership of the, of the set that we're constructing as a function of C0. So if we apply C0 to the R and the X that are actually given to you, this is R and this is X, <clears throat> what would be the membership of C0 in this case? In other words, we are looking for um, a set of two elements where you know the two elements are not the same. I mean, that's kind of the given because a set cannot have two elements of the same thing. Um, but we are also looking to make sure that both of those elements are in X. You know, that is never an issue because if you look at every single element of R, okay, we have you know uh, they are only consisting of elements of X you know, inside the two tuples. Um, but we are also looking for basically, um, you know, if it goes one way, it has to go the other way too. So can, what is the actual answer in this case? What is C0R of X going to return? Hmm? It cannot return a zero, but you get, you're getting pretty close. It returns a set. Yes. Say again. Every set. The empty set. Yes, it does return the empty set. Okay. So in this case, C0 returns the empty set, which means this condition is true. The cardinality of the set returned by C0 applied to R and X is indeed a zero. Okay. Because it's an empty set. An empty set has no elements. So when you try to count the number of elements, it is zero. 
So in this case, it says you know, which relation property is confirmed about R over X. Okay, so now we have to, yeah, go ahead. No, it returns the empty set. C0 returns an empty set. Okay, let me. That is correct. But then you said that there's closure, so that means there's a closure. Yes. So I guess like my thought process is that closure is a non-negative number. No, you cannot find a pair of E and F anyway. Okay. Okay. I see. I see that. Okay. So let me. Uh, I'm trying. I'm going to use. Um, <clears throat> a text editor to kind of describe the answer. So in this case, you know, for part one of one, okay, so part one of question number one, the answer is, um, the answer is C0 of Rx, or the cardinality of that. Okay, so let's make sure we specify cardinality is indeed zero. So now we want to ask what relation property is confirmed about R as a relation defined over X. So now you have to remember what are the property, what are the properties of relations? Reflexive, Reflexive symmetry. Mm-hmm. Those are the basic ones. You know. Yep, the partial order and total order. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Given that you know we do not meet this particular, or I should say, you know, given that we this particular set z zero of c zero of R x is empty, which uh, property is confirmed? Yes. Okay. Let's see. So now you have to remember the four things, you know, and how they're defined. Symmetry is saying you know um, e r f. Uh, if and only if f r e. Okay, so I don't think this is symmetry because you know it has a it has a conjunction in it. All right, so let's let's try to figure out you know let let's see how we can kind of turn this around and if this is the exam, okay, you're in the exam, you see something that you haven't seen before, which is guaranteed. How do you? What is the process to answer that question? So now you look at the four you know, the the few. Uh, properties of relations that we have defined, and there's there are things that are very unique here. Not equal to, not equal to does not show up that many times. In fact, it only showed up in one specific relation property. And which one is that? Hmm? Anti symmetry. Very good. Okay, so anti symmetry is the only one that has. Oh. We also need to make sure blah blah does not equal to blah blah or something equals to something. Okay, so it, it can be the negation of that. So that's why you know this can be anti-symmetry. So if I look at this as anti-symmetry, would it work? In other words, um, is R anti-symmetric? Okay, this is R. Is it anti-symmetric? First of all, what is anti What is anti-symmetry? Now I can understand you don't remember because I did not warn you ahead of time that we're going to be going over exam two, so you're not you did not prepare. That's fine. But yes, go ahead. Property of anti-symmetry states that for every variable uh, or for every two tuple we have within X, mm -hmm. they're um, uh, such that and Fe is within the relation, it's implied that E is zero. Yeah, exactly. So if I, you know, without using mathematical you know, uh, notations, this is how it's defined. For all ways to choose E and F you know, as elements of X, um, E, E, R, F, okay, I'm going to use the simplified version, E, R, F, <clears throat> and F, R, E, implies E and F are the same, okay? So that's um, anti-symmetry. 
So does C0 relate to anti-symmetry? That's the question. I think we see a lot of elements, right? So we see you know, ERF and FRE, okay? Well, this has you know, the conjunction here. Um, the equality is kind of flipped, okay? This is not even required, okay? Because you know, E is an element of X and F is an element of X. That is not required because you know, if R is a relation of X, it guarantees that E and F are elements of X anyway. So these two are kind of, eh, they're not necessary. So we can just analyze the, the first three and ask if this set is empty, does that mean that the set is anti-symmetric? The answer is yes, okay? Because if anything meets this requirement, ERF and ERF and FRE and E does not equal to F, we have just found a counterexample to make this quantified expression false. Is that okay? <clears throat> let, me, let me say that one more time, okay? But this is, you know, this is important. C0 is intended to be a set of counterexamples that R is anti-symmetric. So the lack of evidence, okay, the lack of counterexample that R is not anti-symmetric means that R is anti-symmetric. Yep, I cannot find a counter-example. Yep. Property. Property. Yep. And so because it returns nothing within the set. Yep. Okay, that makes more sense. Yep. So, you know, so the question is, you know, how do you, you know, step by step, okay, look at the expression that is given to you in the exam, in your own exam, and make connections to the things that are already defined in the class. So I can give you a few pointers that cannot be wrong. One, you have to know the definitions, <laughs> right? So that means, you know, it's open book and open notes, okay? So you don't have to memorize all the definitions. You should understand all the definitions, but in case you cannot remember you know, the exact definition, I can understand it, okay? But make sure that you can find the definition. What makes reflexive reflexive, okay? What is sym symmetry? What is anti-symmetry? What is transitive? And so on, okay? So you have to have all of those definitions. So once you have the definitions, then you look at what is given to you that is new to you, okay? This does not, <clears throat> it's not something that we have already introduced in class. It's a notation that you haven't seen before. And then you have to compare to the notations that are a part of the definition, and you try to make a match. Okay, so there are only a few, you know, properties that will call for ERF and FRE. Now, there's one that calls for FRE, EFR, or FRE. That one is, it's not symmetry. <laughs> That one has to do with total ordering. It turns partial ordering into total ordering. And it is called, comparable, yep, mm -hmm. So the relation has to be comparable in order to be totally ordered, in addition to being partially ordered. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look at, uh, we only got a little bit more time. So we'll take a look at uh, the definition of C1. It is also returning a set. So this time, what do you think this one is related to based on the definitions that we have seen <clears throat> in the description of properties of a relation? This one should pop up like that. It's like, oh, this one is so obvious. There's only one definition that requires EFG. Transitive, very good, okay. So this, so now you start to read it and go like, okay, this is not a set anymore. This is now a three tuple, okay? So it's a three tuple. Every element in this set or whatever C1 is returning is a three tuple. It has three elements, E, F, G. Uh, which three, which E, F, G are we choosing? Well, this is the requirement, okay? The requirement is <clears throat> E, R, F. So E relates to F through R and F, R, G. F relates to R through uh, F and G relates you know, through R, and the negation of E, R, G. 
In other words, once again, I am looking for a counterexample. Okay, I got E and F being related. I got F and G being related, but I'm also confirming that E and G are not related. I'm looking for a counterexample of three elements. Of not, they, they are not necessarily distinct elements, but I'm looking for three values, E, F, G, such that it is a counterexample of relation R is transitive. Is that okay? So the question is asking about the same thing. If C1 Rx is a zero, which relation property is confirmed about R over X? The answer is transitive, because I cannot find a counterexample to show that R is not uh, transitive. Is that okay? Yep. Because if, if I can find the values E, F, G, okay, such that E and F are related, F and G are related, but E and G are not related, con you know, specifically not related. So now I go like, hey, if R was transitive, then E and G should have been related. Oh. But since they are not, so this is the counterexample of choosing three values out of X and oh. such that we can show that R is not transitive. But you can kind of see the approach, right? You, know, you have to know the definitions first, and then you try to relate the new expression that you haven't seen before to the definitions that you have already seen. And there are <clears throat> very distinctive things about each relation or each property of a relation that you can kind of pick out and go like, ah, only that one would mention like three variables, right? <clears throat> uh, reflexive is also easy because reflexive is the only one that only uses one variable because you know, each item in X has to relate to itself. It doesn't care about anyone else. It only cares about me. I have to relate to myself. So, so use those kind of characteristics of the properties to help you kind of relate Oh, this one is related to that one. But are we looking for examples or are we looking for counter examples? That you have to kind of work on and go like, because you have to really read the entire Boolean expression and go like, what does it mean? Yep. Oh, oh I think, oh, go ahead. No. It, it means it means e g is not a tuple in r it means e g as a two tuple is absent in r right yeah this is a, a shortened notation right you know, because e r f means e f as an element exists in r so the negation of that means it is absent the element of is false. Okay, so I do have to go now. <laughs> I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Next Monday is a holiday. Yes. Um, I believe so. I think I have a mechanical uh, generated answer. Um, but you know, the the idea is I'm going to I will complete this whole thing next Wednesday. And then the actual exam is the Wednesday after that. Yep. All right. <clears throat>